Well, hello people, happy Tuesday. Welcome back to the channel. If you guys are new around here, thank you so much for watching. My name is Divyanka and I'm a doctor of pharmacy here in the US. On this channel, I strive to provide resources and tips for both you and I to live our best and most productive life. So a couple of weeks ago, I shared a video on the different functional areas a PharmD can enter after graduation within the pharmaceutical industry. Now, just like every industry, there are many, many, many different functional areas. And specifically in the pharma industry, there are so many different functional areas that PharmDs can be a part of. The skill set a PharmD graduates with is so valuable. Not only do you have the curriculum and coursework required for any pharmacy program, which gives you that therapeutic knowledge and that scientific background to really propel you in a career in the pharmaceutical industry, but moreover, most pharmacy students gain a lot of working experience through internships and required clinical rotations from school within the six or eight years of pharmacy school, depending on what track you take. So when you graduate, you are so well prepared for a career in the pharmaceutical industry. Industry. Anyway, I am blabbering on right now, but knowing that your skill set is valuable and knowing that you want to pursue a career in the pharmaceutical industry is a great start, but it's just not enough to actually propel yourself into a successful career. Now, the first step is really getting a grasp on what it is you want to do with your career and which department you want to work in. Now, once you decide this, you can always switch. So many people make lateral career moves within the pharmaceutical industry, moving from one department to another. So again, super doable, but it's really important for you to know the differences between each department, what each department does, why you want to be working in a specific functional area. So to really grasp all that, I have made this video series to talk about and take a deep dive into each functional area. So before watching this, if you haven't watched the overview video of all the functional areas, I would suggest that you probably go watch that first so you have a good overview. And then in this video and in following videos, I'll be going and really taking a deep dive into all the details of the specific functional area. Of course, don't take any of my videos only for face value. I always suggest doing your own research. So take the information that's in this video, put it together with your own research, build your own opinions. But again, I hope that some of the information that I'm sharing is really helpful for you guys. So let's just get right into it. Medical affairs is what we are talking about today. All right, so hands down, medical affairs is the most popular functional area for PharmDs in the pharma industry. Based on the 2021 IPHO PharmD postdoctoral fellowship analysis paper, medical affairs has the most fellowship opportunities within the pharma industry. Now, again, this is only a look into fellowships, but it gives a broad idea. There were about 100 and some more fellowships available in medical affairs compared to any other functional area. So there's both more availability in medical affairs, which is probably why more students go that way. And in the last seven years, the openings for medical affair fellowships have grown just like every other functional area, but the growth has definitely been so much more exponential for medical affairs, again, in comparison to the other functional areas. Medical affairs in general is definitely labeled as a key department within the pharmaceutical industry. But what exactly is medical affairs? So really think about medical affairs as the medical information center of a pharmaceutical company. Medical affairs exists to provide scientific and clinical support for any marketed products of that company. When you're working in medical affairs, you're spanning all of the products that are in the post-marketing phase. So they have been approved by the FDA and again now are on the market. So any activity that has to do with the drug product after marketing is really what concerns medical affairs. Now, medical affairs can honestly look really different based on what company you're working in. Medical affairs is definitely a more newer department. It came about in the 1950s, and overall, people have seen its importance more and more, but I think as an established functional area, it's still getting there. So I think really truly grasping what medical affairs means is something that everyone industry-wide is still working on, and again, the importance is very clearly shown, but medical affairs can span a lot of different types of work, which is why that confusion kind of comes in as to what exactly is medical affairs, what work is spanned within medical affairs, etc. 
So let's talk about some of the work examples and what type of projects, work, responsibilities you may have within medical affairs. So the first and foremost responsibility of someone in medical affairs is to manage key thought leader relationships. Key thought leaders are also known as KOLs or key opinion leaders. And if you're going to look up medical affairs or work in medical affairs, you're going to hear that term KOL all the time. KOLs are physicians who are seen as their subject matter experts and their opinion is highly, highly respected. Now those doctors of course have so much influence on what drugs they prescribe to their patients and because they are KOLs and they're respected within their industries people tend to listen to these KOLs to understand how they should be treating their patients with what drugs etc. So if you as a pharma company have a good relationship with a KOL and they learn about your medication once it's approved and if they want to use it in their practice then again that's really beneficial for the pharma pharmaceutical company. So medical affairs is really who's responsible for creating and maintaining those relationships so that once your products are marketed, you have a group of KOLs that you already have a good standing relationship with who will listen to you. And so your job is to give them the medical information about your drug product in the most non-biased form possible to again help them form their own opinions about your product. But overall that relationship will help business for the pharmaceutical company. Now the next key responsibility within medical affairs is working with data and publishing reports. And the first thing you need to know how to do in terms of working with data is how to understand that data from a scientific perspective and be able to share that knowledge of that scientific data to whoever may need it, whether it's a patient, a healthcare professional, a KOL, etc. In medical affairs, you have to understand who your audience is and be able to relay that scientific information in the language that's most appropriate for that audience. So when you sift through data and have to explain that to a patient, you're going to use different language versus explaining that data to a KOL, let's just say. So again, that skill set of being able to interpret data and share it in the most understandable form is a really valued skill within medical affairs. And the second thing you need to know how to do based on this data is understand its business implications. So if X study had positive results, what does that mean for the company, for the department, from a business perspective. At the end of the day, you're working for a company and a company is a business. So that is something that you have to put together with your scientific knowledge to truly be an asset and be valuable within medical affairs. In medical affairs, you'll also be working on research initiatives that might be outside of the approved indications for your current products. So really taking a look at, okay, we have five marketed products in these different therapeutic areas and then taking that information, doing research and seeing if possibly you can start studies and expand the label of that marketed product. Now, depending on the process, that work is done by other functional areas as well, but for marketed products, some of that research can fall under medical affairs. The next thing medical affairs is responsible for is for really being, again, that medical training center for the company. So anyone who ever has a question about a disease state that the company works on or a marketed product, medical affairs is where people turn to gather that information. And anytime anyone in the company needs to be educated upon the products or therapeutic areas that the company works on, that training and that material comes from medical affairs. So again, anything in regards to post-marketed products regarding medical information is all medical affairs. Now, just to give an overview of what type of scientific data you would be working with, pulling research from, reading, looking into, possibly writing, etc. would be the confidential data that a company has on their marketed products to use that information in patient responses or KOL responses or any other material that's appropriate. And you'll also be working with published studies. And again, knowing how to sift through that data and those papers, etc. is super, super, super important in medical affairs. Like I've mentioned a few times now through out this video, medical affairs is that medical center and it's seen as the face of the company both internally and externally because any education that's coming out of the company or to employees within the company on marketed products and therapeutic areas, again, are coming from medical affairs. Now let's dive into the different sub departments within medical affairs. Now medical affairs itself can be a very large department, again, depending on the company. Overall though, there are definitely some subtypes that are uniform across companies. So I'm just gonna go over them and kind of talk about them to give you an idea of exactly what those are. 
So the first is medical strategy. This is really where your medical directors, your subject matter experts sit. They're responsible for that big picture, looking at all of the details of what's happening, what's to come, how the market is, all of those different assessment details, and be able to provide that company medical strategy for upcoming products. So this is really the team that's working cross-functionally with other departments such as marketing and clinical development and all of those other departments to again bring a drug to market and there's so much strategy that goes into that. So within the medical strategy group, which again may not be its own group, it might just be the higher executives within medical affairs. However, it's structured within a company. Strategy is that key role which is really leading the department and leading the company in terms of the plans for its upcoming drug products. The next sub -department within medical affairs is medical operations. Now you'll see this type of structure within the pharmaceutical company a lot of times. Within clinical, within PV, within medical affairs, there's always an operations group. And as you can imagine, that group handles more of the operations versus the strategy. So the strategy team is really coming up with future plans, plans on how to execute XYZ, and operations is really the one executing that. So whatever needs to be done to actually execute plans that have been approved company-wide or department-wide, etc., are executed by operations. You can always switch between the two, but again, this is a differentiation that you're going to kind of have to think about. Do you want to be on the execution side or do you want to be on the strategy thinking side? Both are great. That's the general track because you need to really understand the operations to do well in the strategy. And you can always move kind of between both depending on what role you're in or some roles might even marry the two together. Again, there can be a differentiation and there cannot be depending on the role and the departments, but overall there are two different teams for this. The next sub-department is field medical affairs. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the role called MSL, it stands for Medical Science Liaison, and in the past five, six years it's become such a popular role that PharmDs want to get into. Now, I explained what a KOL is and that relationship and how important it is. So you need people who are coming from the pharmaceutical company talking to those KOLs, maintaining those relationships, sharing any medical information on your products and your therapeutic areas to those KOLs in the most non-biased way possible and keeping those discussions going. So the people who are responsible for doing that are called MSLs. That is really your field team. Again, there is structure and hierarchy within that team. There are MSLs and then there might be managers and directors who are of course managing those MSLs. And usually when you're an MSL, you have a geographic area that you're responsible for. And so you'll need someone to manage all the different MSLs across the nation, let's just say as an example. But but these are really where your MSLs sit and again very very important and critical to the whole medical affairs team. The next sub department is scientific communications. Scientific communications really spans publications, abstracts, etc. So any type of scientific writing that's really in poster, presentation, publication, or abstract format is what SciComm looks over. So if you're going into a role within scientific communications, you should really think about and know that you'll probably be working on manuscripts and abstracts a lot of your time. And that's really the main responsibility of scientific communications, being responsible for all of those different type of scientific communications that their company may need for different events, ad boards, congresses, journals, etc. Scientific communications is also a popular place to start either as a fellow or in an entry level position. So if you're looking for jobs or fellowships, you'll definitely see scientific communications a lot. And last but not least, the next sub department within medical affairs is medical information. Now medical information is basically the team that again is responsible for disseminating that medical information, but usually it's in a very specific way. One of the main responsibilities is answering any inquiries that come from healthcare professionals, physicians, KOLs, or patients nationally and internationally. So medical information is basically the group that the call center escalates to if they don't have any answers. So there's a call center at pharmaceutical companies and if you have a question and you call them, they'll try to answer questions based on the data that they are allowed to share to you. Now if they get asked a question that they don't have an answer to, or if they don't know they can't answer, etc., then they escalate that to medical information. 
And then your people sitting in medical information, get that inquiry, write a response letter for the question and then send it. Now, of course, writing that letter in and of itself comes with strategy. You have confidential data that you are allowed to use depending on the ask and the question, but there's a lot that you can't share. So again, knowing the strategy of what to share, how to answer the question in the most diplomatic, correct, non-biased way possible without giving too much information, but answering the question and giving the necessary information to help your HCPs and patients out there. So overall, those are the main subtype of departments that you'll see within medical affairs. Now with medical affairs, a lot of the time, a role can span one or more of these different subtypes. So if you guys are looking at job descriptions or fellowship applications, you'll notice a lot of the time that a role could be both medical information and communications. A role can be medical information and have a little part of strategy. So it's really important to look at those job descriptions, whether it's for a fellowship or an entry level role. Again, super super important to understand what the job description is telling you and what that role is exactly going to look like within medical affairs because just saying medical affairs most of the time isn't enough to really understand what you'll be doing. Now, who can work in medical affairs? You don't actually need a PharmD to work in medical affairs or in the pharmaceutical industry to begin with. But why having a PharmD is valuable is because again, the backbone of medical affairs is understanding the science. If you can't speak the science, you can't succeed in this role. So a PharmD naturally prepares you to be good at the scientific information and clinical information. So to work in medical affairs, you can have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or a graduate degree. For many strategy and upper roles, an MD, PhD, or PharmD is most of the time either required or preferred, but again, it's not necessary. For example, I've seen many individuals who just have a business degree or a four-year bachelor in science degree who make their way into the pharmaceutical industry within medical affairs and are very successful. One once you're kind of in the door, your networking and your work speaks more volumes than your degree. But of course, it's important to have that degree to be able to actually make your way in the door to start within the pharmaceutical industry. So in a lot of my other videos, a lot of people comment like, hey, you don't need a PharmD to go into the pharma industry. And I completely agree. But does it give you an edge over everyone else if you have a PharmD? I would say yes. So if you're looking to go into medical affairs, whether you have a PharmD or not, just make sure that your background speaks for itself. You need to be able to speak science and business. If there's any way to get degrees and or experience in any of those things, you will set yourself up for a career within medical affairs very nicely. Again, the most important thing is to be science savvy. So having a bachelor's in science and having a bunch of internships within the healthcare field, I think would be a great example of a bachelor's background that would be successful within medical affairs. Again, just as an example. And the last little tip there is if you can incorporate business and business thinking, business skills, business knowledge into your experience at any point, whether it's just taking a class, whether it's taking a certification course online somewhere, something that can speak to that on your resume, will always help you within medical affairs and honestly within the pharma industry in general. Because again, a pharma company is a company at the end of the day and business is very important. So if you can marry strategies between the science and business, you will definitely succeed within medical affairs. If you can be like, hey, look, this is coming up in the market. These are our competitors. Our drug is gonna be like this. From a business standpoint, it's gonna bring in X, Y, Z. And from a scientific perspective, it hits X, Y, Z. And you have all that information and can really go through it, create your conclusions, etc. That is so, so valuable within medical affairs. And that is definitely a skill set that's sought after. So again, if you can kind of prepare yourself to have that kind of background, if you're interested in this, if you're interested in possibly having a role within medical strategy later on, et cetera, again, those are skill sets that go well together for this role. And the last thing I want to talk about is what does a career within medical affairs actually look like? So usually if you're starting in a fellowship or an entry level role, your role is probably going to be within either medical information or medical communications in a medical writing, medical specialist, or scientific communication specialist type role. Those names can differ again, depending on company, but the general idea is you have 
enough scientific knowledge to kind of start, but it is an entry level role. And so you're going to be doing a lot of those maybe response letters if you're in medical information, helping write publications or other assets within scientific communications, etc. Then, of course, over time, you can grow into roles such as the manager, senior manager in your department, medical directors who are seen as, again, subject matter experts, etc. Now, within medical affairs, within those different subtypes, of course, the roles really differ. And the one role that really stands out is again that role of an MSL within the field team. So again, there are many different roles and many ways to kind of get in them, but generally that's what you'll see on the entry level side of things. And then you can kind of go up and grow into any role that you would want basically. And the last thing I want to mention is how well medical affairs really prepares you to be successful in the pharma industry. The skills you gain within medical affairs are easily transferable to any other department within the company. So again, this is a great place to start. And if you don't know where you wanna be in the future, or if you know you wanna maybe transition into a different department throughout your career, you know that medical affairs will give you the skill set and the experience to harbor the skills that are needed to make that transition. So overall, more the reason to pursue a career within medical affairs. Now, personally, I was super, super, super interested in medical affairs. All my internships within pharmacy school were within medical affairs, whether it was medical information, scientific communications, medical writing, strategy, etc. I really do enjoy the work within medical affairs. I like being the face of the company and taking the data and kind of writing it and presenting it in a different way. I found that very interesting. That's something that I liked to do. And I liked that the information that I was either creating or writing is super, super helpful for especially those external events. So making things for AdWords and Congresses based on internal data or other studies and research is again, a lot of what I did during my internships and something I really did like. Now, post-grad, I actually found myself in a position that's within regulatory affairs and I really do like where I am. So I personally don't know if I'm ever going to make that switch back into medical affairs, but having had so many years of experience within medical affairs, it's definitely a great place for a pharmacy to be. Our education is so perfectly formed for a good transition into medical affairs. And again, the skills you gain within working in medical affairs can really help you with any career moves that you would want to do in the future. So that was super, super long, but I really hope that that was helpful and gave you a good deep understanding of what medical affairs is. Now, although I just talked about it for so long, I can promise you that without actually having experience, it's really hard to understand what medical affairs does versus any other department because honestly, after a while, it all starts to sound the same. They all work on drugs, they all work to get something approved, okay, great, you know? So again, I would highly recommend take the information in this video, do your own research, put it together as much as you can with any other resources and get experience if you are in school or even if you're not, it's never, ever, ever too late to make a transition into anything that you would want for your career and experience is the best way to learn. Overall, I hope this video was helpful. I hope you guys find this series helpful and I hope you guys have at least one thing to take away from it. A few last notes for you guys. If you guys liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps with the algorithm and while you're at it, you might as well subscribe. And if you guys like the hoodie that I'm wearing that says straight out of refills, or any of my other merch, the link is down below. I have a bunch of different colors, a bunch of different designs, and I myself own a lot of them, so I hope you guys like them. I hope you guys check them out. That is it for today's video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, you guys will see me in the next video. Mm -hmm.